It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, it's a, a real honor to be on such a, st a distinguished panel. Uh, I'd uh, really like to thank George Soros for his generosity, but also really for his vision that an institution like INET is needed. And uh, I'd also like to thank Rob Johnson and the other organizers for putting on really just a spectacular conference. It's really wonderful. Uh, the paper that I'm going to present today is, of course, uh, uh, joint work with uh, my longtime uh, co-author, Roman Friedman. Uh, it, it draws heavily on research that we've been doing on a new book, but also on earlier research exploring the importance of imperfect knowledge for economic outcomes and for thinking about the relative roles of markets in the state. Uh, the proponents of the efficient markets hypothesis like to think of it as an approximation to what goes on in asset markets. The basic narrative that they have in mind was articulated early on by one of its founders, Eugene Fama, who argued that competition among the many intelligent participants would result in an efficient market at any point in time in which the actual price of a security will be a good estimate of its intrinsic value. Fama understood that individuals have to cope with imperfect knowledge. As, as he put it, there, there is always room for disagreement among market participants concerning just what the intrinsic value of an individual security is, and such disagreement will give rise to discrepancies between actual prices and intrinsic values. But he argued that if such discrepancies were systematic rather than random, participants would attempt to take advantage of this knowledge and neutralize it in price series. As Marcus was referring to, uh, uh, economists like to uh, use the term arbitrage, arbitrage these uh, discrepancies away. Uh, by doing so, prices would presumably reflect available information and fluctuate randomly around true intrinsic values. Marcus would then allocate society's scarce capital nearly perfectly, and attempts to use available information to earn above average returns would be impossible. Of course, the financial crisis cast a lot of doubt on this view, this narrative account of nearly perfect efficient markets, and many people began to refer to it as the myth of the rational market. Supposedly, markets are not dominated by intelligent investors, but by too many irrational participants who do not base their decisions on fundamental factors, but instead fall prey to emotions, herding instincts, bandwagon temptations, technical trading rules. Uh, I, I think we've heard uh, terms like madness, emotions. Uh, but the alternative mathematical behavioral finance models, uh, those that formalize irrational decision making in fully predetermined ways, imply that the rational market has not disappeared for good. After all, these models assume that if individuals could somehow be, if irrational individuals could somehow be barred from influencing market outcomes by regulatory policy or other means, the rational participants would regain the upper hand, thereby restoring the rational, nearly perfect market. In the paper, Roman and I discuss how financial economists over the past three decades have transformed the narrative account behind EMH into a theory of asset prices. Uh, their use of the rational expectations hypothesis to portray intelligent investors' forecasts has led them to ignore the key point. The underlying values of assets unfold over time in non-routine ways that no one can fully foresee. There is thus no true intrinsic value that competition among intelligent participants could possibly establish. The idea that individuals act as if they can just arbitrage away discrepancies between actual prices and intrinsic values simply has no meaning. The rational market, therefore, is a myth in the strictest sense of the word. It is a widely held but false belief. It cannot be turned into reality by any means, including regulatory policy, no matter how wise or efficacious. Acknowledging ever imperfect knowledge implies that even if the market were populated solely by intelligent investors who pay attention only to fundamental factors, financial markets would be imperfect assessors of asset values. 
that such EMHs claim that markets are stable and get prices right on average just doesn't have any rationale. Unfortunately, many public officials, especially in the U.S., actually came to believe in EMH's strong claims about asset markets. This belief underpinned the massive deregulation of financial markets that we saw in the 1990s and two, early 2000s, which made the crisis more likely, if not inevitable. The presumption that intelligent investors' forecasts can be portrayed with REH has also led to the view that asset price swings are bubbles. And Marcus was uh, talking about the bubble view of uh, swings in asset markets. Bubbles arise because market participants ignore altogether fundamental factors. But the bubble models lead to an extreme view of the role of swings in capitalist economies. Supposedly, they serve no useful social function. The belief in the adequacy of economists' standard of rationality also gives rise to two extreme views concerning the role of the state in asset markets. The state should either leave markets unimpeded, other than ensuring transparency and dealing with other sort of ideal conditions, or extinguish asset price swings as soon as they arise, even if this requires massive intervention. Roman and I advance an intermediate view of markets, which we call the contingent market hypothesis. CMH recognizes that an overarching model of modern economies is beyond the reach of economists or anyone else. One of CMH's key implications is that price swings lie at the heart of what markets do. So eliminating them as soon as they appear, as the bubble models would have us do, is likely to dampen the volume of innovative activities. Although markets play an essential role in allocating society's scarce capital, they are not perfect. Imperfect knowledge about how to interpret fundamental factors in forecasting future returns implies that price swings can sometimes become excessive. And this provides an alternative rationale for state intervention in asset markets and has important implications for how regulators should measure and manage systemic risk. Let me now just talk a little bit about the key assumptions that economists have used to turn their narrative account behind EMH into a, a theory of asset prices. Economists use standard probabilistic formalism. In, in the paper, we sketch how revisions of forecasting strategies, new economic policies, or other non-routine change leads to shifts in the parameters of probabilistic models. But economists insist on specifying all such change in advance with mechanical rules. Uh, Ro Roman talked about fully predetermined models. In fact, the vast majority of economic models assume away change altogether and presume that the same exact model and distribution for the random shocks can account for asset prices at every point in time, past, present, and future. But ignoring non-routine change is not enough to derive EMH's strong claims about markets. Economists must also assume that participants never revise their forecasting strategies. Paul Samuelson's seminal Martingale result showed that if one disregarded non-routine change and imperfect knowledge, that asset prices would fluctuate randomly and provide good approximations to the true underlying values of assets. But at the end of his 65 paper, uh, he actually admitted some great doubt about uh, the analysis that he had uh, uh, provided uh, the profession. Uh, and actually, he, he published the, his study more than 10 years after its development. He, he questioned where the basic probability distributions are supposed to come from. In whose minds are they ex ante? Is there any ex post validation of them? He confessed to having oscillated over the years between regarding it as trivially obvious and almost trivially vacuous and regarding it as remarkably sweeping. Financial economists recognize that tying EMH to REH does not provide a completely accurate view of the world, but they argue that formal tests require formal models. 
And they point to an enormous amount of statistical research, which they interpret as providing strong empirical support for EMH. University of Chicago's John Cochran recently claimed that EMH is probably the best tested proposition in all the social sciences. However, almost all of the empirical evidence that they point to presumes that any correlations in the data that might be found are stable over time. Such analysis misses the non-zero but changing correlations in the data that arise because the process driving asset prices undergoes change, non-routine change, that cannot be fully foreseen. By ignoring non-routine change and presuming that REH is the standard of rationality, EMH misses what markets and participants really do. The reason that markets play an essential role in modern economies is precisely because change is contingent. It is affected by unforeseen causes or conditions. And knowledge is imperfect, giving rise to diverse views about the future. This way of thinking has led Roman and I to propose the contingent market hypothesis. Like EMH, CMH supposes that price movements depend on available information, including observations on fundamental factors specific to each market. But CMH also supposes that the causal process underpinning price movements cannot be adequately characterized by an overarching model. CMH leads to four main implications. First, because change is contingent, Statistical estimates of fully predetermined models of asset prices vary in significant ways as the, time period examined, as the time period examined is changed. The evidence that causal relationships in asset markets are temporally unstable is overwhelming. William Sharp quipped in an interview that it's almost true that if you don't like an empirical result, if you can just wait until somebody uses a different time period, you'll get a different answer. CMH implies a fixed trading rule that generates excess returns on average over some stretch of time will eventually cease to do so. Although proponents of EMH seem to have misinterpreted the results of their empirical studies, they have uncovered much evidence supporting this claim. Without an overarching model, there's just simply no objective criteria to pinpoint the time or predict the way in which the process driving market outcomes might change. This implies that there are temporary profit opportunities from gathering and using information to spot or anticipate contingent change. And this explains why so many market participants ignore EMH's strong implication that everyone should passively invest in index funds. Uh, George Soros being a, a notable uh, uh, example of this, and uh, we should all be thankful that uh, uh, George Soros did not uh, follow the, uh, uh, the uh, implications of EMH. Uh, finally, the normal state of financial markets is one in which prices undergo swings of uneven duration and magnitude away from and toward estimates of commonly used benchmark levels. An imperfect knowledge economics model implies that price swings may occur even if all market participants forecast prospects solely on the basis of fundamental factors. An IKEA model of asset prices also suggests that efforts by the state to counter fluctuations as soon as they arise, as the bubble models would have us do, are likely to reduce society's dynamism and growth. This way of thinking leads to an intermediate view of the relative roles of markets in the state. So long as asset, prices, uh, asset price swings remain within reasonable bounds, the state should limit its involvement to setting the rules of the game, enforcing simple fixed capital requirements, ensuring transparency, and eliminating other market failures. But market participants have imperfect knowledge. And price swings, therefore, can sometimes become excessive. Although policy officials also have to cope with imperfect knowledge, 
They can implement measures to dampen excessive swings, which include uh, guidance ranges for asset uh, prices and changes in capital and margin requirements that depend on whether prices are too high or too low. One of the key principles behind the excess dampening measures that Roman and I propose is that they target bulls and bears differently. So if you think about what would be needed to dampen an excessive upswing in an asset price, well, you'd want to discourage the trading behavior of the bulls and encourage the trading behavior of the bears. This suggests that uh, policy proposals such as uh, uh, you know, wholesale ban on short selling is, uh, well, it could actually lead to more instability, not less. The merits of excess dampening measures depend on whether policy officials can ascertain with some degree of confidence that prices have become excessively high or low. And of course, the problem is, is that no one knows the exact future prospects of assets. So no one knows the range of, well, it implies that the range of non-excessive values is, is difficult to, uh, to ascertain. Historical experience is a good place to start in designing guidance ranges for asset markets. Uh, consider the U.S. stock market. The uh, graph here plots the S&P 500 uh, price index relative to a trailing moving average of earnings all the way back to 1881. The uh, lower and upper bands of the guidance range are the fifth and 95th percentiles of P.E. ratios. And for example, the uh, region above the upper band then would represent the 5% largest P.E. ratios historically. The graph shows that in the normal course of the market's functioning, equity prices undergo swings, which sometimes become excessive. Uh, the graph also shows that when the price swings rise well above or fall below most estimates of benchmark levels, the, the market itself judges them to be excessive and eventually self-corrects. But this can come so late as to lead to sharp reversals that impose enormous costs on the financial system and the real economy. So for example, by 1990, the end of 1996, the P-E ratio had reached levels that the market had seen only 5% of the time in the preceding 100 years. Now the market did eventually self-correct, but only three and a half years later. Even with such a crude measure of a guidance range, had there been a policy framework in place that put officials on guard for excess and equipped them with tools to dampen it, the excessive upswing in equity prices may, would likely have ended much earlier. It's, 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 it's really important to emphasize that aiming to dampen excessive swings is quite different from attempts of central banks to confine asset prices to pre-specified target zones, also quite different from counter-cyclical policies. Uh, the idea behind excess dampening is that these measures only kick in once the asset price is beyond the range, beyond the guidance range. Within the range, uh, the uh, officials uh, are pretty much setting the rules of the game and markets are trying to figure out values and, well, that's what markets do. Um, but because of imperfect knowledge, sometimes these swings are excessive, and so that's, that's where the, sort of the rationale is for the state to step in, only outside the range. Let me conclude by just saying that from a, a broader perspective, the regulatory policy, policies that Roman and I propose acknowledge that within limits, properly regulated markets are far superior than the state in allocating capital. However, active but gradual state intervention is necessary to guard against the social and economic costs of occasionally excessive swings. IKE's excess dampening approach aims to restore a much needed balance between what should largely be left to the markets and what only the state and collective action can accomplish. Thank you.